by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I really love uh, this uh, story from Genesis that Kirk read this morning, the characters, uh, Adam and Eve, the talking snake is a lovely kind of addition to that uh, story, um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that would make Adam and Eve like gods, <coughs> give them the ability to discern between good and evil, I think it's a great story, I can't uh, tell you this morning that I understand every nuance or detail of this story, but it is a great story. Adam and Eve, they ate, they did not die, at least physically, at least right away, as the story goes. But they realized in that moment that the knowledge that had been imparted to them left them naked. It left them stranded, it left them exposed, it left them alone. In the biblical story, humans are presented from the very beginning as hungry creatures. Adam and Eve ate because they were hungry. And of course, we are hungry too, and we hunger not just for food, but we hunger for intimacy. We hunger in our lives for good, fulfilling work to do each day. We hunger for healing. We hunger for good relationships. And the list goes on and on. But all of this hunger is symbolized, I believe, in the most basic appetite of life, which is for food. Every morning, it is the first thing that we encounter. When we get up in the morning and our stomachs are empty, what do we look for? We look for something to eat. Or if you're like me, you look for something to drink, like a good strong cup of coffee, right? We're hungry people. And uh, we are never satisfied for long. Our lives depend on eating. And that's created by design, by our Heavenly Father. And the Lord God commanded Adam, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the one tree, the one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day you eat it, you shall die. It's about eating, about our hunger, about our appetites. So 40 days, Jesus hung out in the wilderness with the sound of the wind in his ears and, and uh, the sand in his ears and those haunting thoughts uh, in his mind, hungry for 40 days, but he did not eat. Thirsty, he did not drink, Matthew tells us. And so at the end of that time, he is famished. And it's no wonder that the devil comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, why don't you turn these stones 
into something to eat. Turn these stones into bread. And at first we have to wonder, what's the big deal with turning stones into bread if you're hungry? If you have, have, haven't eaten for 40 days, what's the problem? And certainly there is nothing wrong with eating. Later in the Gospels, Jesus would feed 5,000 people. Why? Because they were hungry. So why does this event rank as a temptation? We are created as hungry people. Every morning the first thing we do is confront our appetite. Maybe you are hungry right now and you're not listening to me, but you're listening to your stomach that is growling. Rest assured, we'll have coffee and donuts here in a few, in a few <coughs> minutes. But our hunger is not just for food. We hunger for relationships. We hunger for love. We hunger for security. We hunger for power. We hunger for health. And we hunger for our dreams to come true in life. And our hunger confronts us with a choice. A choice that we are created to make every single day of our lives. Will you believe in your appetite or your hunger? Or will you believe in the faithfulness of God? This is the heart of the temptation story we find in Adam and Eve, and its fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ. Will you believe in your hunger? Or will you believe in the faithfulness of God in your life. Now in the Genesis story, the whole world was given to us for food, all with the exception of just one tree. And it is amazing how much of the biblical story involves all of this eating. It starts with the depiction of hungry creatures, Adam and Eve, Covenants are sealed in the Old Testament by people eating together. For 40 years, God's faithfulness was experienced by eating the manna in the wilderness. And then in the New Testament, Jesus fed thousands of hungry people and established his sacrament of Holy Communion, the Last Supper that we will experience and share in today. And then the end of the New Testament ends with this heavenly banquet hosted by Jesus Christ himself. According to the Bible, eating is seen as a way of nurturing grace in our lives. Now you may be thinking, I didn't need to come to church to be reminded to eat. I can handle that uh, on my own just fine. Thank you very much. I came here to find some spiritual inspiration in, in church. But I think that's the point of eating, at least in the Bible. It is to find God's presence. It's about eating. Now I loved to visit my Aunt Clara in Ivanhoe, and I loved to visit with her because I knew there would always be plenty of food. I mean, even when Aunt Clara turned 100, you always knew that when you visited her in her home, that she would have a table full of food, even if you arrived unexpectedly. She would go downstairs, make her way down her basement steps, and she would come up with containers of brownies and cookies, and pull out of her refrigerator apple pies and pumpkin pies and open-faced sandwiches. There would be so much food. Aunt Clara was convinced that food was the cure to most problems in life. And it didn't matter if she knew all your problems or not, she would put food in front of you and she would say, you just need to sit down 
let me fix you something to eat. And somehow it always made you feel better. Why was it? Was it the food? It wasn't really because of the food. It was because <coughs> of the love at her table. It was the love that was found in the food at Aunt Clara's table. And if you think about your most cherished memories of times when you felt so very loved in life, the chances are great that it involved a table and that it involved eating. Even if you eat alone, you have only to bow your head and give thanks for the blessing of food to turn your solitary meal into an experience with the very love of God. If you see that food at your table as a blessing of God. So eating is perhaps the last natural sacrament that we all practice in life. Now I remember when our kids were at home and engaged in so many activities in school and, and in the community and we would sit down at the dinner table and we would go over the seemingly endless list of busy activities that we had to do the next day. A basketball game, not giving that up. A band concert, concert needed that. Dance practice, well that was too enjoyable. Choir had a concert coming up. Needed to get around and sell some pieces for the agape singers, and then there was church, and then there was Sunday school, and then there was confirmation, and then there were the committee meetings because we wanted to be involved in the community as well. In eating from the tree, how do you decide the lesser good out of all the goods in life? It is tempting to choose one good over so many goods. But look at the story. When the evils of this world are so tricky and so masked and so snaky, we might say, Adam and Eve ate from the tree and they became like gods. <coughs> But they did not become God. And it is easy in this busy life to forget that while we may appear to be like gods, you and I, we are not God. We are not the centers of the universe. So partaking in that tree only leaves you feeling naked only leaves you feeling frustrated and stranded and exposed. It only leaves you feeling alone. Where is the tree that leaves you feeling clothed and supported and encouraged and redeemed? Well, where is that tree? It is a tree that we put out in the season of Lent. And you can see it right there over in the baptismal font. The tree of the cross. And if you, if you miss that tree, then you can see the crosses that adorn our chancel space. That is the tree that makes us feel clothed and blessed and not alone. And this is why we gather here, week after week, to hear our story, the story of a God who loves us enough to come in ordinary food, to come to us in bread and wine, to come to us in water and word, to hear the story of a God who, by that tree, is a God who presides over this meal of bread and wine, 
to hear of this God who presides over all of our lives, even our busy and hectic lives. The story of a God who loves us enough to gather us together here and to gather us together in all the other places where we live and find ourselves with the cross of Jesus over us. Not just here in this place, but the cross of Jesus over us in our busy, crazy, and hectic lives as we go to work and as we care for the people that we work with, as we care for our children, as we care for our aging parents and grandparents. This is the cross, the tree that follows us in all of those places, all those ordinary places in our lives, and redeems them all, fills those places with the grace and the presence of the love of Jesus. Because our real hunger in this life is for God, and all of our activities are a, a way of blessing us for us to know this God who is with us. And that is why we teach our children to bow their heads and to say a prayer before we share in a common meal, before breakfast, before lunch, before we eat supper together. Because it is in those little blessings that we say before a meal that we are reminded of the many blessings in our lives that come to us. That God is blessing us 